Welcome into the Crypto Bunker. Uh, welcome back to the Crypto Bunker. It's been a while. Um, you know, I hope that my last video sort of helped you guys to make a decision about what you wanted to do um, in terms of the markets. Um, I think where we left off, I think ETH was uh, around 3,200. I gave a target of around 2,400 for the... Um, for you know the next target, and I think that you know we hit that pretty perfectly. Um, right now, I'm I'm looking at Matic, um, and I guess we can just start off here, and then I'll go to ETH, and then we'll look at Bitcoin, and and then we'll talk about a few other things that I think are important to know uh, for for yourselves, uh, for your families, for um, just in general. Um, so we'll start off at looking at this. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that I guess I look really look, look at the daily, um, how we hit pretty perfectly this line um, that I've you know always sort of looked at as where the bull market started last year, or at least for Matic, um, where we corrected to in July, and then now we kind of hit this again here. Uh, we didn't quite get there, but we pretty much count that. Uh, as a bottom. And so I actually just picked up some more Matic. I, um, if you follow my Twitter, I, I told people to sell, you know, around maybe here, like 230. And then I said, again, we have another chance to sell when it got up here because we had a little bit of a head and shoulders. We had a shoulder, a head, shoulder, and that played out uh, perfectly. Um, you know, so I'm willing to come in and sort of take a risk on Matic here. Um, I, um, I think that we are in a somewhat of a bear market. Um, I don't know if it's an extended bear market. Um, you know, according to Keith McCullough, uh, you know, who I follow um, pretty closely now as part of the macro show on Hedgeye, he believes that we are in um, quad four, which is slowing growth and slowing inflation. And that we're actually going into a deeper quad for if the Fed does decide to raise rates. Um, so I think in that scenario, crypto um, probably gets crushed, but it doesn't mean that you can't accumulate along the way strategically. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, take some of those profits that maybe you listened to me, uh, you know, way ahead and you, um, you got out at, you know, ETH 3,800, ETH 3,200, or maybe even uh, in November when I talked about uh, how I thought ETH was, was looking like a macro top on the weekly, um, that you maybe even took some then, and maybe you've been waiting for the dip. Well, you know, then this is, this is a time where you, you could step in and take a portion of, the, of those holdings. Um, none of this is financial advice. And then you could um, look at starting to accumulate some of the, the better coins like Ethereum, Matic, um, you know, maybe you're a Bitcoin person, that's fine too. And so, yeah, so I'm looking at this and this is kind of an interesting wedge that formed here. Um, if you look at it, you know, we take it from here and we hit a lot of points through here. Um, and this is where we bottomed out as well. And then we take um, this, this part and we so uh, based on this wedge that's forming here, we can look at a target of, you know, basically the all-time high uh, or the high here, um, 290. But in general, this is pretty much was like a double top. If we look back at it, um, you know, we thought we were going to break through because we, we did break out here. But a lot of people uh, nowadays, they long the top. Um, so when something breaks through its previous all-time high, they end up longing that top. But if you if you got out uh, with me around this level or maybe even this level, um, you know I think it's it's a safer spot to accumulate down here. Um, so I did just buy back in uh, my original position, and so you know I saved myself you know maybe um, like a thousand dollars honestly on on those moves, and uh, you know that's that's not uh, you know the not chump change you know so. Um, so yeah, this is just a first accumulation, I guess. And I think the, the, the thesis behind Matic um, that I would give is that um, 
you know, Matic is like a, it, for me, it's a leverage bet on Ethereum. Um, the reason that it's a leverage bet on Ethereum is because Matic isn't a single proof of stake chain. So Matic isn't actually like the token. It's not actually, um, it's not actually just used for Polygon. It's going to be used for Polygon Hermes. So they have all these different, like different chains that are all part of the Polygon ecosystem. And all of those chains are working to scale Ethereum. Okay. So when you, when you think about Ethereum and you think, uh, okay, well, why is it so slow? Um, you can't really use the main net network. And that's true for a lot of people. And so Polygon is, is helping to scale all of those things, but they're Ethereum maximalists, basically. So you have the, the idea of um, Ethereum scaling to the world, and that's what they want to do. So they're doing this through all these different chains. Polygon Hermes is a ZK rollup. Polygon Nightfall is an optimistic and ZK rollup. Polygon Avail, data avail availability network for volitions. Polygon Maiden which is a ZK rollup, Polygon Zero, which is a ZK rollup, and Polygon Edge. And so it's a full scaling solution suite for Ethereum. And they're committing a billion dollars to zero knowledge research and development. And ZK uh, rollups are widely accepted as the future of Ethereum scaling. So Polygon is positioning itself in the center of all um, of, all of it, of the scaling with Matic, token absorbing all of the value um and so you can follow uh crypt crypto maxi 420 to um at crypto maxi 420 to get updates um on polygon he does a really good job of kind of tweeting uh those those things like every day almost just to remind people of what's going on um and we can see some volume has come in here uh, on the green side. So we did have a lot of red here, um, probably the biggest red volume we've seen since back here. Um, and so, but we have some green coming in. And I, like I said, I think the first target is there. And then, you know, this is almost like a big accumulation, right? So it's, we haven't really had the true move yet. And so I think the true move will take us to around like six, maybe something like that, $6. Um, is what I'm looking at. So obviously there's a lot of things going on in the macro. We could talk about that um, moving forward, but you know, I still think it's important to be positioned in crypto um, because you know the blockchain is going to be a huge part of, um, of the future. And so we have to be positioned both ways, right? We have to be positioned for sort of like an end of the world scenario, but also out positioned for um, sort of like a roaring 20s, like innovation, um, you know, um, sort of like really great decade where we just, you know, have all this technological innovations and all this digitization of everything and things like that. And hopefully that can be positive, you know, and um, we have to make sure we're fighting for our freedoms at the same time. You know, we don't want um, our central bank digital currency to track us everywhere, right? Even, even if it's on Ethereum, right? So if they come out and say, we're going to, you know, build this CBDC on Ethereum um, and Ethereum goes to the moon and we're all rich and we're like, oh yeah, you know, do whatever you want with the CBDC because we're all rich now. Um, that's not cool. You know, like I won't support that. Um, so, uh, and I think that that's why ZK rollups are so important because there's zero knowledge proofs so you would you would be able to make payments without um with just you and the recipient knowing um what you did and not anyone else outside of that system so i do i actually do want the cbdc to be on ethereum and, and use as a zk roll up maybe it's even uh, powered through polygon who knows um we're just so early in the game here still um so anyway if you're looking at ethereum you know, it sort of was like, it's like a series of bear um, pennants. Um, and if you follow my Twitter, you sort of know what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, we had these sort of pennants that were playing out. And when you see these, this is not like what you want to see in a bottom. So we saw this sort of 
crash down. And then what you do is you, um, you can see if this, this plays out again, you, um, you take this, this, and you just move it down here. And that's pretty much where our target uh, ended up. Um, and then, you know, I kind of was suspecting that another one was forming, but we broke out of that. And so, and we put in like, um, you know, almost five days in a row of green candles. So that's kind of what I look for in a potential bottom. We, we did see a volume breakout as well uh, yesterday. And so um, the target here would be about 3,200. So back up to around this area here. Um, and then if we can break 3,200, I think we could head to, um, let's see, I think like maybe around 4,300. Um, so if you just take that sort of leg as, as like the potential, uh, yeah, it'd be like around 4,300, depending on where we are. And that's like the complacency leg, right? So that's like probably the craziest short squeeze we could possibly get. I wouldn't be surprised um, if, if February is a really good month for like stocks and for crypto and we sort of have a squeeze and we go up and that's kind of why I bought some Matic today because I'm like, okay, this is like way lower than it probably should be. Plus we get, if we get a rally, um, you know, Matic could head to, you know, even it's all time high again. And I could make, you know, maybe 1300 bucks and then just kind of take that out and then just watch it, whatever, you know, it might do from there or, or just take it all out again. Um, because I believe that I don't believe it will go above this. So this is like the uh, worst case scenario for the bears on uh, maximum pain. A lot of people will FOMO in above 4,000. Um, and, and, and if we don't close a weekly candle um, above that, then I would not, um, let's see, if we don't close a weekly candle above, um, yeah, like 4,000. Um, I also, I want to see a weekly candle of, of 4150, 4130, um, somewhere, somewhere around there for, for me personally to be like, okay, something has changed. Um, you know, even, even above 4,000, if we close a weekly candle above 4,000, I'll be impressed. Um, I could see a scenario where we do rally up to here. I mean, we do have ETH 2.0 coming. Um, I don't think it actually is going to happen in June. Uh, so watch out for that. I think it's going to be delayed again. Um, you know, it's, it's a complicated process. They want to get it right. Um, but for me, I took profits mainly. I took pretty much almost like everything off the table around here, 3,800. And so, um, I guess I, that's probably a key level. Um, like I said, around like 39, 3,800, 4,000, and then 4,150. Um, that's kind of where we could see some re serious resistance. Um, if we blast above that and people long, and then we get a 43, and then we hit this line, this is a key line. And a lot of times uh, when you do have a bear market, you do get this chance to get out um, where it'll, it's called a complacency rally. Um, you can look at it on like the Wall Street uh, cheat sheet and see what that looks like. Um, and so, yeah, that's what we're looking at for um, Ethereum. We can see, let's look at a few other um, key levels here because we can look at like the 200 day and um, let's see. See, it's still below the 200 day. Um, so for it to hang out below the 200, and this is kind of where I was saying uh, before, like if you haven't gotten out, like we're, we're broken below, we tested the 200 and we went down. Um, and then we had a, um, a death cross where the 20 day crossed uh, the 200 day. And see, when you can see here, we just, we rallied immediately back. Once we went below the 200, we rallied below way big rally. Um, and so we're going to face probably some major resistance around the 200 day, maybe around 3,400 by the time we get there. Um, so my base case is still that we had lower. So even if we got a rally up to 4,300, 
I think ultimately we test around like 1400. Um, and that's where I'll be looking to back up the truck, um, trade in some of my gold and silver that I accumulated uh, from my 3,800 ETH uh, cell. And so I've been accumulating physical gold and silver. Um, and the reason I have been doing that is because I think it's important to, when you get out of an overvalued asset, you want to go into an undervalued asset. And I still believe that gold and silver um, hold a place um, for everyone's portfolio. Um, I think at this point in the cycle, you want to, I would personally want to be at least 10% exposed to precious metals. Um, at least gold, you don't need to be like speculating on silver like, like I am. I'm sort of a silver bug. Uh, but gold is really important. I mean, central banks have been accumulating gold harder than they ever have before uh, in the past you know, seven years or so, um, really since the financial crisis. You can look at China um, has been accumulating gold like crazy. Russia has been accumulating gold like crazy. Um, really, central banks across the world, um, except the U.S. for some reason. But the U.S. Has, still has the most gold technically of any uh, central bank or any country. Um, it's mainly held in like Fort Knox. Um, and a lot of people think like, oh, the gold's not there. But I mean, technically, it's on the books. Um, and so what they could do with that gold, like they don't have any Bitcoin, right? So what they could do with that gold um, is they could raise the price of gold to then match the debt in a reset sort of situation. And they could say, we will take your gold at $20,000 an ounce and um, we'll, we'll buy all your gold um, at $20,000 an ounce. And, and they could make that price um, basically to even out the debt. So the $30 trillion, if they have um, you know, 8, 000, you know, 10,000 tons of gold, and you know they make it uh, twenty to fifty thousand dollars an ounce. They could then offset the debt. So if they want to restore confidence in the dollar or the currency, this is sort of one of their only options because this is the asset that they hold uh, is gold. You know, um, so they could they could technically reset the price and say any American citizen that has gold and they want to um, turn it in for dollars, this is what we'll offer you. And that would help um, people, you know, restore people's confidence in the dollar. Now, that's kind of like a worst case scenario, but I think we're sort of headed possibly towards that. So um, that's a reason to have gold for sure. Um, it's also insurance against a cyber attack. Um, the, the World Economic Forum, um, if you follow them and the world leaders um, have been talking about a cyber attack, just like they talked about the possibility of a pandemic before COVID. Um, they're now talking about a cyber attack and they play, they did a war game uh, of a cyber attack in um, they did a war game of a cyber attack in December. Um, and so they had like all the biggest countries and all the biggest, um, you know, people there um, who, you know, Anyone who was anyone was there basically to simulate a cyber attack. And they said, you know, the, the markets crashed, everything went to zero, basically, um, you know, financial ruin, everyone ran the banks. Um, in this scenario, gold would be unattainable. So you have to know that you would literally not be able to buy gold and silver. They would be gone immediately. Um, you know, you might have like what it may be uh, like if you got lucky, um, you know, you might be able to get some. But I just think it's important to have physical wealth um, in your hands, in your possession, no counterparty risk. Okay. So what counterparty risk is that gold is gold. So if I'm holding an ounce of gold, it's worth a certain, it's, it's worth an ounce of gold, right? It doesn't matter what the price says. An ounce of gold is an ounce of gold because there's only a certain amount. Um, it's, it's been money for 5,000 years. Central banks hold it. It's basically their only real asset on their balance sheets. Um, and so it's insurance against your entire digital net worth. So if all your wor net worth is on a screen and we have a cyber attack and the power goes out and, you know, there's major issues, maybe there's war with Russia, you know, things like that. Um, you know, we did hear Putin say, 
Uh, but he said the next big world war will be fought with zeros and ones. And that means that it will be fought by cyber attack coders, um, you know, people like that who, um, who already have really been kind of spying on us, messing with our, um, some of our companies and different cyber attacks. Um, and so you want to hold your, your wealth um, partially in physical metal or physical gold or platinum or silver so that when, you know, um, if that happens, you can say, okay, I, I, my wealth is okay because, you know, gold is now unattainable. It's basically worth $5,000 an ounce now. And so my 10% holding in gold has now become 50% and I'm safe. Um, because also what, what the banks can do is they can uh, do what is called a bail-in. And so a bail-in is that legally, okay, if there's a run on the bank, they can say, we don't have your money. Um, we can give you a stock certificate for the bank. Uh, and now you hold equity in a dead and failing bank, basically. So, um, this is legal to do. Um, it's called a bail-in. And a lot of people don't read the fine print, but your money is not completely safe in a bank. So the other option you could do if you don't want to buy gold for some reason, um, I actually would recommend to do both of these things is to have physical gold and to have uh, cash on hand. Um, because if the banks do, if you do get a bank run, everyone's going to want to take their money out, which right now is, is cash. And so I think the reason they would do a cyber attack, um, these, these planners of the world, um, and they would blame it on Russia or they blame it on China or whatever, but they, you know, it's, it's a setup, is because they talk about the Great Reset. And you hear Klaus Schwab say there will be a cyber pandemic or a cyber attack that is greater than any pandemic we've ever seen. Um, and so what they want to do with this is they want to build back better. Um, and building back better is basically, um, everyone sort of losing their wealth, uh, not having, not owning anything because it all went to zero, but you know, I still owned gold and silver, so I'm good. Um, and then they would make a central bank digital currency, probably a worldwide currency, potentially not maybe just like nato or whatever whatever the new world order would be um but then they would they would have they would basically have us all on chain tracking us um and trying to um basically reset us with the central bank digital currency they would say you know they would blame everything on the banks they would say oh the banks failed look at how you you know, ran to the bank and they didn't have your money it's a fractional reserve system. They only hold about like 10% of the total um, money that they should be, uh, or it might even be like 1% or something. Um, so the, you know, then the federal reserve will take over as the, um, the lender of last resort, the people that have the central bank digital currency, and then you'll have a federal reserve wallet um, where you will potentially um, have to participate in their game where they, you know, they make you get the jab uh, to then, you know, be able to use the, the, the currency. Um, there's different things. They could limit your freedoms. They could say, um, you know, um, oh, you didn't, you know, do this or, you know, you can't uh, spend at this place or you have to spend this amount by this time. You know, they could set it so they could, they could uh, control inflation by setting the amount of time you have to spend this um, digital currency. So those are, that's a lot of thoughts, but if there is a cyber attack, you wanna make sure you have physical wealth in your hand. You also wanna make sure you have storable foods. Um, so canned foods, you know, um, you wanna have, you know, spaghetti, rice, um, peanut butter, you know, nuts. You wanna have um, meat that's in your freezer. Uh, you might even wanna have a, a portable stove. Um, so winter well, uh, if you guys have heard of them, does um, they do stoves where you can actually, um, let's see if I can show you guys. 
Yeah, so I actually got one of these. Um, you can see it here. Uh, it's not that much. Uh, yeah, so I think I got a large uh, potentially. So it's like 400 bucks. And basically what it is, is um, you just put like a log or two of wood in there, you light it up, and then there's like a boiler uh, up here. So you can, you know, boil water, you can cook steak on a, um, a iron cast skillet. Um, you can cook, you know, fo any food really you want on there that you cook on a stove. Um, and if you have like a French press, you can make coffee uh, with the boiled water. So, you know, these are things that I'm personally thinking about. I know, um, you know, some of you might uh, be like, oh, this is crazy. But I mean, look, these people are war gaming out the potential of a cyber attack. I think that a lot of people are waking up. Um, you can see what's happening with the Freedom Convoy um, in Canada. Um, which is beautiful, by the way, um, and amazing. And it gives me hope for the future. Um, so don't listen to the mainstream media who tells you that they are fringe minorities who are, um, you know, desecrating graves and um, stealing food from the homeless. They're feeding the homeless, okay? Um, I've been watching live streams of these people. Um, and believe me, uh, when I say that they are amazing, there's grandmas and kids and 90 year olds out in negative 30 degree weather because they all know that what what uh, Trudeau is doing to the Canadians is, is um, messed up. So we need to fight for our freedoms. Um, and for me, if in a cyber attack, crypto would also um, probably go to zero, um, you know, whatever, not maybe not, you know, technically or whatever, but it would get bad. So like I said, you want to have um, that hedge on your crypto holdings as well um, to have, you know, physical metal that you can hold in your hand. Um, you know, and silver, silver is a different story than gold, right? I, I already went over why you want to hold gold, but silver um, is, is also sort of um, on the same path as, as crypto. So silver also, has, it kind of has both sides of it. So it has the, um, the end of the world scenario where you want silver to trade. Um, so you want like, um, you, you know, you can, they call it junk silver. So it's 90%, um, you know, things like this, uh, like the Canadian, uh, the Kennedy, um, or the walking Liberty. So that those are 90% coins from, uh, pre 64, I think, um, coins, um, for trading, like, you, you know, uh, you can always go to a farmer's market and get a um, a thing of eggs, a carton of eggs for a silver dime, mercury dime. Um, so keep that in mind because uh, they're worth about like two bucks usually. Um, and so, you know, people know that. And if you work with your local farmers and your, you know, your local um, community on these things, um, you can really start a revolution to, to go local. And I think that that's what, you know, we need to do. If you, if you don't know your neighbors, which like, I, I only know a few of my neighbors. So once spring hits, I'm probably going to walk around and just knock on some doors and just introduce myself and, um, and really just try to get to know people. Um, you know, um, but anyway, silver, is a bet on the future because um, they, you know, a lot of these world leaders, they want to go sustainable. So they want to do, um, you know, ESG. That's going to take a lot of silver. Okay. So we already know that, you know, solar panels take about um, 0.63 ounces per panel. Um, so these panels are being installed everywhere and there's just not enough silver in the world for Amazon and Google who, you know, want to run their entire companies on solar by 2030 there's not enough silver for these people. So if we take the silver off the market for investment purposes, and then they take the silver off the market for their solar panels, for computers, for um, health, you know, antibacterial, uh, for car, you know, electric cars, for um, all different types of technology that use silver, um, there's, there's truly not enough. And we know that silver is sort of manipulated um, by the big banks. Uh, who they, they offer silver to these big companies and they say, we'll sell you 800 million ounces of silver for this price. And then they have to keep it below that price for the entire year before they have to deliver the silver physically or else they lose money. 
So we've seen this over time, uh, then basically the um, paper derivatives of silver are about 100 to one. So for every one ounce of silver, there's about 100 derivatives um, that are traded around. And so that's why they're able to just knock the price down. But eventually in a crisis scenario, or just over time uh, through physical demand, the, uh, this system will break. And then we will see what the true price of silver uh, might be. Um, if you look at the debt clock, um, you can see what the true price of silver should be. Um, over here, it should be about 29.93 per ounce. Um, and that, that's based on just the amount of dollars that are in circulation. So if you look at the dollar to silver ratio in 1913, it was $2.66 an ounce. And so that was probably the price of silver back then because it usually followed the money supply. Um, but now it's manipulated, so it's not. But once it gets out of manipulation, uh, no one knows the true price, right? So we can estimate that it could be around there. Um, gold is, should be about $21,866 per ounce because in 1913, it was about 30 an ounce. And so that, again, was tracking the money supply. You know, gold was about $28 an ounce uh, in 1913. Um, so there was really no difference between the, do the dollar price and the dollar to gold ratio. Um, and so these are the prices that it probably should be. Um, I'm looking for like $200 silver. Um, I've actually showed the silver price in the past. And maybe we can look at this here um, because it's pretty interesting uh, to look at on the weekly. And let's see if I can just kind of get rid of some of these. Um, so if we look at silver on the weekly chart and we look at this, what do we see? Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> um, it should remind you of this. It's literally the same exact chart as Ethereum. Um, I've been trying to say this. I think that each day in silver, or sorry, each week in Ethereum is about a day in silver terms. Um, so, if, you know, this is where we are. Uh, right here on the silver chart, right here, right around three hundred dollar ETH. Before we went nuts, before we did a, we before we did ten X. Um, just look at this. I mean, look at that. Okay, put that in your mind, and then look at that. It's like the same thing. It's the same chart. Look at that. And even all of these, like, I'll take I'll take this off here because. Um, even like these little corrections that happened, right? So we have, we have this little thing here, right? So we have that in silver right there. In Ethereum, we have another one here and then a drop, okay? Another one here and a drop. And they both did this at the, in the 2020 mark. And then we have a rally and like a wedge that formed here, um, you know, sort of like this where it looked really ugly, you know? And, and so we had a crash and we had, you know, so like, let's see how that, how that played out here. We had a crash and then we kind of came up and then we went down and we broke through kind of that lower low. Um, same with this, we kind of broke through that lower low and people were like super bearish. And then we kind of just like rallied sideways and up. And then we just started to go. Um, I'm not saying that this is for sure gonna happen, but it's just interesting to look at, um, to sort of look at these charts side by side because they're just so similar. It's crazy. It's crazy to me how similar they are. Um, so it looks like ETH is rallying uh, today. Let's, let's take a look at this again. Um, yeah, it's, it's rallying again here. Um, so this is like what we wanna see. Um, we wanna see like five days in a row, like we saw here. Uh, you know, we saw a bunch of days in a row here. I think it was like two weeks in a row. So yeah, we see some volume coming in. Um, you know, cool, cool beans. 
Uh, like I said, I sold a lot at 3,800. So we'll see what happens. Um, like I said, I do think this is kind of an area of resistance. Definitely the 200 day moving average. Uh, it looks like we're breaking almost the 20 day here. Um, and so we want to, you know, um, you know, we saw a big uh, sort of gap area here. And that's kind of where we're filling this gap. What we want to see is we want to see us break through the 200 day retest the 200 day, then maybe go. Um, that would be another sign to look for. Um, so I hope you guys got something out of the video. Um, you know, I think the main thing I would say if you, if you got anything out of it would be, um, you know, to just prepare for anything. Um, I do think we're headed into some crazy times, um, but we also might be headed into some great times. So you want to be prepared for both. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, take a look at Ethereum. Um, Matic for me personally uh, is something that I want to hold as sort of a leverage play on Ethereum. Um, so yeah, um, again, hopefully you guys got something out of it. Subscribe, like the video if you haven't before uh, and uh, have a great day.